Good evening, everybody. I'm Dr. Susan Corso. The formality not necessary, but I'm used to saying it. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, we're here tonight to talk about how to be a shocker detective. And I, I chose that sort of whimsically one day. And my husband said to me, actually, that really is what you do. You really do use the chakra system to detect what's going on in other people. And I have for 40 years. So this past year of semi-COVID isolation, COVID, Omicron, all, and all their buddies, um, I finally sat down and, and organized my thoughts and wrote eight workbooks on the chakra system. They are actual workbooks where um, I wrote some pages in it, but the work part is yours, not mine. They're physical workbooks. You can get them on Amazon. Uh, the name of them is Energy Integrity. And that is the last advertisement you will hear. Um, but the reason I did that is that I believe about your chakra system. And, I, and my experience is borne out over many years that the chakra system is actually the life force prana, chi, mana, whatever you want to call it, the life force in the human body viewed through um, a prism. So you see all the colors of the light that actually animates you. I find it very interesting that people who go to medical school study 11 systems. Well, if you know anything about gematria, which is Hebrew numerology, which is the genesis of all numerology after Arab, um, that numerological system says that 11 is a lovely number, but that the holiest number is 12. <clears throat> Excuse me, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 months of the year. That 12, that 12th system in the, is the human energy system as far as I'm concerned. And nobody is taught that we have one, not one of us. I mean, if you happen upon the chakras and, you know, I've been doing a lot of podcasts lately and talking to people and saying, you know, well, do you know what the chakras are? And everybody goes, well, yeah, I kind of know what chakras are. Chakras are these, you know, things that along your spine and they, they give you energy or that I, I, you know, but no one really, there's not a lot of teeth sinking into chakra information. And so I started realizing many years ago that I do the work that I do as a medical intuitive and as a counselor by working with and looking at a chakra system. But when I say looking at, I'm not, um, I'm not snooping. I'm not looking at your energy systems or reading them or anything like that. I don't do any of that without permission. But the chakras are an early warning system. And I truly believe that what they really are is your subconscious mind. That that is actually where everything is recorded in your being, is in your chakra system. And it remembers past lives and current lives. And so the workbooks take you from what you learned in the past about each chakra to what you believe now about each chakra and help you program the changes you wanna make for your future into your chakra system. It makes complete sense to me that if you pattern the energy the way you want it, you should be able to program the life that you want. So <clears throat> with that in mind, I decided that the thing to do this evening was to focus on uh, what most people know colloquially as energy links, uh, leaks, energy leaks. What do you do about energy leaks? And there will be those who say that uh, energy leaks are holes in your aura their unfinished business. I actually think that most human energy links leaks are related to uh, Pythagoras's second aphorism, which is govern your tongue before all other things. 
I think that we create our own energy leaks most of the time by things that we say. And we don't do it on purpose. We don't, you know, we don't mean to create an energy leak, but like this, you see someone in the elevator and the person says, we should go to lunch. And you go, oh yeah, we should. Knowing full well, you don't mean that you want to go to lunch and you don't go to lunch, but what's left in the energetic is a hook. Well, how many times no, you don't make agree agreements to go to lunch 20 times in a day, but you tell people, oh, sure, I love those shoes. Or you tell people, oh, I didn't mean to do that when you did, right? We make social nice, right? And uh, I don't know about you, but I am of an age that I was trained to be nice. If you don't, if you ha don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Sound familiar to anybody? <laughs> oh, sure. Right. So what do we do? We make nice and actually compromise our own energy systems, which is why when you ask people how they are these days, 90% of the time, the answer you get in one form or another is toast. People are exhausted and they're exhausted all the time. I think the most exhausted of us are the single moms. And I think the single moms are cross-eyed, most of them, because of all the energy that they're putting out. And what happens to us is we go from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. So by the end of the day, we got nothing left for ourselves, right? And a keto master who is approached by person plum finishes with person plum and then returns to herself before she turns to person peach to deal with that one, right? But we don't do the return to self thing and check in. So I think of the chakra system as an early warning system like this. You go to work on Monday and you have a little bit of a sore throat. Not a lot, just a tickle, right? And you know that by the end of the afternoon, you probably should go home and have a hot cup of tea and a hot bath and read your book and go to bed early and you'll feel better on Tuesday. But when a coworker says to you, oh, let's go out and go dancing, you're out until two o'clock in the morning. And then on Thursday, you have to stay home because you have a cold. Because you let your brain override your mind. And you didn't pay attention to the message of the tickle in your throat. Right? Well, we all do that. We let our brains override our minds. Now, we call that mind over matter. That's actually not mind over matter. <laughs> not at all. That's a form of personal bullying, right? You bully yourself with the things you want to do instead of listening to your body. One of the things I'm known for saying is that chakra work doesn't require a mat or a class or a teacher, although it helps to have a teacher sometimes. A lot of teaching about chakras, I think, is very complicated. Nine lessons and 3,000 pieces of this and this and this. And I don't think they're complicated at all. I think the point is this. The most important thing about chakras is that they talk to each other. So if I played a, a middle C for you on the piano and said to you, this is music, eventually somebody would say to me, no, it's not. It's a note. One note does not make music. Two notes makes music, right? Two chakras makes an energy system. We all have one. Most of us don't know it. And how do you pay attention to it? How do you figure out what your chakra systems say? Well, there are a lot of different ways to figure out what your chakra systems say. One of them is premised on the notion that everything in our lives is a mirror. So I'm going to give a first chakra example. The first chakra is uh, sort of Bing cherry red, you know, like a dark red. And it lives uh, at the base of your spine by your coccyx. It's a big sphere of energy. And it has to do with clan, survival, tribe, 
who you belong to, how you belong, but also, also food, clothing, shelter, warmth, air, water, those basic needs. So I'm going to offer each one of you a gift, and I mean a free gift. You will be able to find this in the show notes or on YouTube. And that is if you will go to um, Susan uh, to chakras at susancorso.com, you will come upon two digital downloads. I call them the less mores. Uh, they are free. They are actually free. You don't have to put your email address in to get them, right? We're not, you're not paying with you. Um, but what they will allow you to do is begin to work with your chakra system right now, this second. And what that means is the less mores mean that usually there is a behavior that you will notice in either yourself or in the people around you that will give you an indication that you're caught in something around your first chakra. That, that behavior is complaining. If you're complaining or if all of a sudden everybody in your world is complaining, it's time to go, hmm, what is my first chakra doing? What is happening here, right? Complain less. Well, there's an answer to that. And the leak is the complaining. The energetic leak is the complaining. Because what does it do? It reinforces neural pathways in your brain about negativity. Right? We all do it. All of us, right? There are stories that we tell in our lives that we tell the same way over and over and over again that reinforce the bad stuff. Perfect example. Um, you go and give blood at the lab because you have to have a blood test. And two days later, the lab calls you and says, oh, we're so sorry, we lost your sample. You have to come back. You get on the phone with your best friend and you go, rah, 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 waste of time, can't believe it, this and this, and this. don't you, right? All of us do this. Nah, 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 right? The little hamster in your head. Okay, let's say you get to the lab and the tech recognizes your name, the phlebotomist, and she says, oh my God, I am so sorry this happened to you. I can't even believe it, but I have to tell you something. Something really important happened because we lost your blood sample. And what we've done is we've redone our whole protocol and that will never happen to another person again. Well, you will give your blood the second time. You will get in the car or on the train, right? And call your bestie and go, mm-hmm, guess what? I changed their whole protocol. So you're not running in the negative hamster wheel anymore, right? Now that's a simple one. That's a pain-free one. That's an inconvenience one. What happens though, if it's a deep, dark ouch that you rehearse over and over and over and over again, and you dig in that negativity? Well, there's a solution and there's an immediate solution. And that is to begin to thank more. So complain less, thank more. So you can say to yourself, hmm, I wonder if I need to feel appreciated about something that I feel underappreciated about. Now, that doesn't necessarily, you're going to mean you can get it from someone else, but you can at least go look in a bathroom mirror and say, I appreciate you, right? There's a start. But you can also turn it on your world and begin to thank people for what they're doing in your connectivity, right? Because it's both internal and external, what's happening. Completely normal. Well, there's a less and a more for every chakra. So by paying attention to what's coming toward you in your reality like this, right? So it's complain less, thank more. In your second chakra, it's transact less, discover more. Transactional relating is calculated. It's um, manipulative. I'll do this for you if you do this for me. Right? Quite specific, right? Instead, hmm, discover what I can do for you, discover what you can do for me. 
completely different or orientation to life, same experience, interaction, right? Third chakra, it's con control less and encourage more. Everybody likes to be in control, but being controlling is a problem, right? And that's in your actions. Instead, when people feel out of control and they get controlling, they're afraid. What do they need? They need courage. They need to be encouraged or we need to be encouraged, right? Fourth chakra, heart chakra, hate less, embrace more. I had a boyfriend many years ago who every time anyone used the word hate said very loudly, ouch. Boy, it cured all of us from saying the word hate. And people use it all the time, right? Oh, don't you just hate that? Ah, no, I don't hate anything. I don't want to add to the hate in the world. Thank you. There's plenty. It doesn't need my little contribution. Nope, 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 right? Embrace more. You don't have to like what you're embracing, but at least you have to acknowledge that there are things that happen in the world that you like, you don't like, you have an opinion about. Well, okay, opinions are cheap. I don't like the way the guy who lives next door to me believes politically or votes. He does, however, do all the snow blowing. So, um, you know, am I going to be cranky with, <laughs> with him because I don't like the way he votes when he does all the snow blowing all winter long? I'm not. I'm going to thank him. I'm going to embrace him for what I like about him, not reject him or hate him for what I don't. So this is all about choosing behavior based on your own energetic signals. Now, let me go to the fifth chakra. It's criticize less, celebrate more. Ever noticed yourself getting into a really critical pattern? And the wildest thing about the complaining and criticizing is both of those are verbal, right? There's a, but fifth chakra and first chakra are correlative. So that makes sense. They're verbal. When you start criticizing everything around you, whoa, something's happening, pay attention. Or when people all around you are criticizing, what does it mean? It means it's time to celebrate. It means it's time to find one thing that's good. I don't care if it's, I was breathing when I woke up this morning. And I mean that. I, I, I'm not being, um, I'm not exaggerating. I'm dead straight serious, right? Well, the alternative is kind of different, isn't it? So we're glad that we're breathing when we wake up in the morning. That's a good idea. Okay. Then the sixth chakra, assume less, listen more. When we assume, we think we know what is actually going on instead of paying attention to what's actually happening. And that goes with a second chakra. So two and six have correlation, right? Those are all mind. So transacting and assuming are mind things. They're calculations, the way you're working things out, right? So if you suddenly feel manipulated by someone, huh, are they transacting? Are they assuming about you? It's worth asking these internal and external questions because you can get information and function better if you manage your own energy system. Third chakra, as I said, is controlling. Opposite is encouraging. So uh, seventh chakra, hoarding versus sharing, right? And controlling and hoarding are both actions most of the time, right? Those are body behaviors, okay? And then hating. And the eighth chakra, which I teach, is uh, the, it's a chakra that is about six inches in front of your thymus gland. It's rosy pink. It was discovered by the rabbis in, uh, who studied Kabbalah in Spain in the 1870s. And it's, it's the compassionate heart. It's impersonal love, not personal love. And it's in front of your thymus gland. And what it offers you is emotional, spiritual, and psychological immunity. So when somebody hurts you and your heart aches, you gather up all that hurt in your heart and you put it in your eighth chakra. 
because your ace chakra doesn't get hurt emotionally, right? So that's judging versus accepting. And here we have hating and judging. Those are both spiritual practices. So by noticing what's happening outside you and what's happening inside you, and these things can happen both ways, it doesn't matter. It's all going to be a mirror no matter how you look at it. You then can learn to actually manage yourself energetically so that you can live in integrity. Now, when I say integrity, I don't mean integrity like uh, the superhero that, you know, is the morality wizard, right? I don't mean integrity in that sense. I mean wholeness. I mean the whole you. And my teaching begins with the premise that you are an integrity, that I am an integrity, that the planet is an integrity. You are integrity, like in the sense of integer, a whole number. You are whole. You're not broken. You're not flawed. You're not a problem. You're not an issue. But we love and have learned to lead with that. Right, Carolyn Mace calls that leading with woundology. Right? No, 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 no. Not interested in that. Lead with your own wholeness. Lead with your own well-being. How do you do that? Well, one of the things you learn to do is tune into your chakras, which you can do standing on the corner of 22nd Street and 8th Avenue, waiting for the light to change. Right? That simply. You don't need a mat, a book, a teacher, a nothing. You need yourself and your own ability to witness, your own ability to pay attention to what's actually happening in your body. Now, the body thing is utterly magic as far as I'm concerned, because bodies don't lie. And the reason bodies don't lie is because they can't. Not possible. Now, can we use our brains to override our minds? We sure can. We do it all the time. But that's not paying attention to what's actually going on, right? You know, they say that um, the worst suicide, uh, suicide rates happen on Mondays always. Or no, Sunday nights. Sunday nights because people don't want to go to work on Monday. Well, if you had paid attention to that dread in your stomach three years ago, you might have been able to do something about the dread, right? But it's subtle and it's quiet. Bodies, unless there's an emergency or an accident, bodies don't whop us over the head with information. They wait until we hold still and are quiet enough to ask. Oh, huh. I used to um, go to dinner at my ex-mother-in-law's house. And she used to make me, make me so angry that I would leave her house with laryngitis every single time. And I'm not kidding you. It got to the point where my husband would just laugh all the way home. And uh, she made me mad because she used to say to her two-year-old granddaughter, Michelle, pray for your sins so that we can have dinner. And it, 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 I still listen to me stammering. That was that was thirty years ago, forty years no, thirty years ago that it would make me that angry, right? Well, I finally learned, huh? I need to do something about that. I didn't need to confront her over dinner with her granddaughter or her theology, which I thought was a travesty, right? None of that. I needed to take Michelle aside, the two-year-old, and give her a big hug and say that God loved her no matter what, which is what I did. And the minute I started doing that, because I paid attention to what was happening, it stopped happening, right? So how do you learn to actually work with your chakras. Well, 
I don't need anyone to share with me what's really going on in their lives at the moment, but this is how I work with uh, my clients that I've had for 40 years. I've had a practice for 40 years of helping people get through things that they can't get through and they can't figure out why. And it doesn't matter if it's a company. Companies have chakras. It doesn't matter if it's a planet. Planets have chakras, right? Everybody has something that animates them. Everybody. I suppose not, you know, not marionettes, but, but you know, a, a living being, right? <clears throat> Animals have chakras. If you've ever tried to do Reiki on a cat, you know that because the cat will sit for about half a second and be like, okay, I'm done, <laughs> done with you. Um, so what I thought we might do is an exercise and learn how to pay attention to your bodies and figure out for yourself which chakra is being bothered by any particular thing. So it doesn't matter what issue you pick, but I would say to any one of you, pick the thing that's bugging you the most right now. I don't care what it is. It doesn't matter what it is, right? It can be physical, it can be emotional, it can be mental, it can be spiritual, right? You know, I don't know what happens after death is just as legitimate as, well, my left ankle still hurts, you know? And it, it, it doesn't matter. Whatever's bothering you is what's important. If you will pick one issue and state that issue to yourself, whatever that might be, right? Um, I'll, I'll do a political one and I'll do it out loud so that you hear what I'm doing. So, uh, I don't understand why there's such bad polarization in the world right now, particularly in the US. And I have an immediate physical reaction to that statement. Now, what happens for me is my third eye, sixth chakra right here, which is indigo. And indigo is that color that no one can ever figure out what it is. It's purple and blue together. Um, my sixth chakra has a feeling in it, like someone has pulled it apart. Now, what could that possibly mean? Well, here's how I would interpret that. If you were sitting across from me and it happened to you, I would say, okay. The planet, the whole planet is based on polarity, day, night. There are opposites everywhere we look or complements everywhere we look. The law of complementarity, you could call that instead of the law of polarity, right? Okay, but polariz polarization is actually polarity times 10,000. Pulled as far apart as it can. Well, why wouldn't my third eye be pulled apart? That's exactly what's happening on the planet. That's an explanation as far as I'm concerned. Now, what do I need to do about that? Does it bother me? Does it upset me? Does it give me a headache? No, but I sure would say honestly that maybe every other client I have mentioned something about the polarization in the world right now and how upsetting it is. What can I bring to that discussion out of my own experience? Well, let's look at the less mores. The sixth chakra less is assuming. And the sixth chakra more is listening. Oh, so I assume that I know what that means, the polarity, right? I've named it. I have made that assumption. I'm, I'm assuming that the polarity isn't exactly good for us. The polarization isn't good for us, right? There's an assumption. Well, wait, listen 
to the polarization is the message. What is there? What is there that can be, and this is always my question, that can be a blessing? What is there that there can be a blessing? All kinds of things that are dreadful happen to people all the time. I'll be 65 in three weeks. Believe me, I know about life, right? Crummy things have happened. Okay. But the point is, what do we do with them? Well, one of the things that the chakra system will allow you to do is learn to tell a different story. And that's what matters, is to be able to create a narrative about events in your life that creates meaning. You know, I've written more than 30 books, which is so exciting. Um, a lot of them are fiction. I write mystery novels and I write romance and I write um, historical fiction. It was my last one. And they're so much fun. And I love writing them because I write about metaphysicians. I write about people like me who ask questions like I'm asking now. So I write about the kind of people I want to know in the world. I want to know who's asking the spiritual questions. How are they wanting to be a blessing in every situation, right? As far as I'm concerned, the solution to polarity and the polarization on our planet is to listen more. So the next time I see the snowblower guy, I'm going to ask him what he thinks about the elections that are coming. And instead of talking and having an opinion and assuming and pre-deciding and pre-judging, that word is prejudice, right? I'm going to listen to him and become a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. Now, I picked a social issue that any of us could relate to because we're all experiencing it one way or another, right? When it's personal, though, you have to learn to be able to make those kinds of connections and associations, right? So you're going to free associate. You're going to let your mind go. So say to yourself your sentence about whatever the thing is that's bugging you. And see if you get a response from one chakra or another. And somebody tell me which chakra that is. Susan? It's my heart chakra. Okay, thank you. And can you, can you describe the sensation? It's a weight. Mm -hmm. um, Hot or cold? Yeah, I, I'm, it's heat. Uh, it's pressure discomfort, disappointment. Okay. Thank you. Very useful. Okay. So the first thing I would say in a situation like this is disappointment. Disappointment is the reason I wrote a book called God's Dictionary because God needed a dictionary clearly and um, she hadn't written one and I was free, so I did. Um, but the idea is that if you take the word disappointment apart, when you are disappointed, you are not appointed. You are not chosen for something, right? So there's your, there's your clue. There's your, ah, okay, not chosen. And that heaviness, the pressure, that's legitimate. However, because it's hot, it's likely a little bit of anger, right? This wasn't fair. Okay. A hundred percent. This wasn't fair. Okay. So now that you know that, right. And it's a heart chakra issue. So heart is hating, not that you're hating, 
but how do we find a way or probably not, but, uh, but you're disliking, you're disapproving, you're uncomfortable, you're, you're not liking what happened, whatever that is, right? How do we find a way to embrace it so that you don't have to hurt anymore? Well, the first thing you do is you gather up all that hurt and you put that in your eighth chakra right? So you don't have to feel the personal hurt anymore. But then you want to begin to ask questions. Wait, I wasn't chosen. Is it stopping me from choosing in some way? Do I need to make a choice that I'm not yet making? Huh, that's worth looking at. I don't know the answer to that question, but you will know, right? Am I... um, essentially rejecting because I felt rejected. What am I rejecting that I need to mm, not necessarily accept, but allow to be so, right? My mother-in-law made me mad and she made me mad every time I went to dinner. Okay, so I had to say, okay, she makes me mad. I don't have to like that. And the truth, I finally got to, the truth was, mm, I let her make me mad oh uh, right ick ick but by knowing that i thought hi i wonder if i don't let her make me mad what happens right i wonder if i don't reject if susan doesn't reject what what might that be how 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 might that make some sort of space for the hurt not to be there anymore. Now, the temptation in a situation like this, and in almost every chakra situation, I like to nip this in the bud early, is people say, well, you just have to forgive. Don't. Okay? Just don't. No, it's not to say you won't forgive, but here's the thing. You know, there's that expression, forgive and forget. No, don't forget. Wrong. You need to learn whatever you need to learn from this experience. (laughs) But forgiveness comes absolutely naturally when you've done your work, right? When you've processed the feelings and it doesn't hurt anymore, you forgive because it's just, oh yeah, right. That was dusty. Never mind. I don't need it anymore. Right. Forgiveness is a natural end to a process. It doesn't begin something. And if you begin with forgiveness, what you're going to do is self manipulate and that's not good for you or anybody else. So don't do it that way. You know, no need to self manipulate, but There is, you know, in the book of Proverbs, it says uh, life and death is in the power of the tongue. What are we saying? What are we saying about our situation? What are we saying about our feelings? What difficulties are we rehearsing and running in our brains? You know, in um, the illusions of a reluctant Messiah, which was uh, Richard Bach's second book after Jonathan Siegel, um, he uh, the, there's a magic book inside the book and you open it to the page that tells you exactly what you need every time, just like the perfect, which is so for any book, but never mind. Um, but one of the pages that it opens to is um, argue for your problems and sure enough, they're yours. Right. And you know what? That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true for all of us. Right. We tell this. St- how do we tell? How are we telling the story? Are you telling the story? as though it's your problem. And if you are, ow, right? So any problem that you have can be read through the chakra system if you will free associate, if you will start to ask questions and you need to ask I questions and you need to ask you questions, right? Is something happening outside me that I need to pay attention to? Those are the you questions. Or is it something that I'm doing or thinking that I need to change? Because it's the experience that you're going to have is internal and external. You can't help it. That's so of all of us. The world is a mirror to who we are, right? So when 
you know, when you're in the parking lot of a, of a target and suddenly a butterfly comes and sits on your arm, right? We take that personally. Oh my gosh, this beautiful butterfly came and sat on my arm. What do you suppose that means? Right? Of course, we do that all the time. What's so, so we, we want to know what that means on the inside of us. We also want to know because it's something that happened on the outside of us. Why is that right? Maybe it's because you're wearing the perfect perfume and the butterfly likes it. Who knows? Right. But that's your, you take that as a message. There are messages from the inside and from the outside all the time. If we'll pay attention when the outside messages are negative, we don't like to pay attention. Right. We like to diss those messages. We like to go, ah, uh, no, not so, you know, not such a big, mm, no, right? Uh-uh, they're all messages, all, which is why my belief in the world is that the most important word that all of us ever speak or think ever is and. And the reason it is and is because every time I use the word and, I include all of us. When I heal something inside me, I'm healing it for the whole world, not just me. Everybody heals because of it. All of us heal because of it. That's not, um, that's not big or uh, important or anything that we could actually be conscious of most of the time. But Every time you heal a little bit of heartache, the heartache in the world heals, right? That's why you're worth it and it's worth it to pay attention to this kind of work. And what I found is that the, first of all, because your body doesn't lie or because it can't lie, the chakras will not ever set you wrong. And I have seen people heal things that are amazing. I had a woman come to me once um, who was an opera singer. And she had lost the top third of her range, which was a serious problem. She was a coloratura soprano and she was seeing, she had a series of contracts to sing in European opera houses, including Lucia de Lammermoor, which is one of the most difficult soprano roles in opera. And, um, she came to me because she had been to every ENT, every voice doctor, every wizard, and no one could help her restore her voice. And, you know, I'm an intuitive. That's how I do my work. So I said, um, okay, you're going to think I'm a little bit crazy, but... How old were you when you had the abortion? She was in her forties. And she said, 14. And I never told another soul. I said, well, were you raised Catholic? She said I was. But I'm not a Catholic anymore. I said, yes, but at 14, were you a Catholic? She said, oh, yes, I was in the ninth grade in Catholic school, right? So she really wasn't Catholic at age 14. I said, you realize that you're living with a decision that you made about yourself at age 14, that you are berating yourself for having been steeped in a Catholic theology all your life. You didn't have any other way to think about it. So she sort of went, hmm. I said, I'm going to give you two words. I want you to say them to yourself over and over again for the next week or so, and you'll get your voice back. And she said, really? I said, uh-huh, here they are, te absolvo, which is what a priest says at the end of confession, I absolve you. Well, this woman looked at me and she said, I can't, that, that's impossible. I said, actually, no, it's not. <laughs> it's not even close to impossible. But, you know, work on it. It's okay. But let me ask you one more question. She said, all right. I said, well, how do you know 
that you didn't do God a service by allowing that soul to come to earth and be embodied for three weeks or so and then graduate. How do you know that that soul isn't supremely grateful to you, that you were willing to let it go? She, she, I mean, the poor woman couldn't talk at that point. She was like, whoa, seriously? I said, yeah. So let me tell you a story. Um, I got into this spiritual work quite seriously because my son died the day he was born. It was one of the hardest things that ever happened to me. As I say now, one of the best, worst things that ever happened to me. It sucked. No one's kid should die before them. Next. But it did make me turn to God and say, basically, whiskey, tango, foxtrot. Like, what? And there was no God in my upbringing at all, right? I ended up with a, as a minister with a doctorate in divinity. Give me a break. Talk about a pattern, right? Well, one of the things I learned from that baby, my son, Isaac, is that babies have souls. They come here to do something. My baby needed to be here for two hours and nine months. Okay. I gave him a kiss, sent him home. Good enough. Took me a long time to heal, which I did, but okay. Well, from that experience, I was able to say to this woman years later, how do you know you didn't do God a service? How do you know that good doesn't come out of supposed evil? The thing that is in the way of that, the thing that is the quote unquote bad thing that's happening for you is an opinion. My darlings, opinions are cheap and plentiful. <laughs> we all have them, right? So. What do we do? We investigate. And that's the thing to do with your chakra system. You use it as a tool to investigate yourself. I have seen chakra work actually make someone's therapy of 15 years make sense in about 15 minutes because they didn't understand how to take the understanding from their brains into their bodies. The minute they get that what's happened in therapy all these years actually applies to their bodies and they can get well, they can heal. I saw a woman heal multiple sclerosis that way, literally going from two canes to playing tennis in six weeks because she finally understood what the disease was telling her. There's no accounting for it, which is why it's so exciting to me. So now we have a few minutes left. We have 10 minutes left. I will happily answer any question any of you have. If yes, ma'am. Um, Susan, I'm struggling and I'm sure it's uh, sort of I'm still an immature part of me with what's the difference between asking the you question and then going to assuming. Um. It's, it's, am I assuming something about something outside me or am I assuming something about something inside me, right? It's not it's, quite what I'm asking. You, you suggested asking is the, uh, asking I questions or you questions. Uh-huh. My concern is if I ask a you question, am I filling in a blank by assuming something about the other person? It's possible that you are. Um, ideally, what you want to do is wait and see what comes to you, right? So instead of, this is a, an intuitive process. And so what I try to do by focusing people in their own bodies by doing this is going past the logical mind, right? The logical brain. So when I say, huh, are people all around me complaining? And I just haven't put person A, B, C, D, E together because they weren't all sitting at the same conference room table making the complaint, right? We don't always put those things together. So what I'm looking for is lateral thinking and intuitive thinking. So intuitive thinking that comes up from within, not 
Well, if they're all if they're all complaining, they could all go to their rooms, right? Like 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 the patriarchal dad response, you know. Well, uh, okay, wait, no, let's not do it that way, right? That's logical. That's what you how you learn to respond to that. Mm-hmm. So yes, you can fall into assuming, but you know what? You know what truth feels like in your own body, Susan. There's a bell. We all have it, right? When something's not true, when we self-manipulate, you know what we do? We try to talk ourselves and everybody else into it. Don't you think it's a good idea for me to go to Nepal and blah, 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 blah. Uh, Wait a minute. If you have to talk me into you going to Nepal, there's a problem, right? <laughs> right, now that's a silly one. But people talk themselves. I mean, I, one of my closest friends in the whole wide world, when he asked his mom why she got married, she said, um, the invitations had been sent. Well, she spent 25 years arguing with that man instead of simply saying, don't save the date. Wow. Wow. She wasn't listening, right? That's the point. You are the very, very best expert on you. So even if, you know, you were to bring me, uh, have a session with me and bring a problem, right? Like I can't figure this one out. I've gotten this far myself. I mean, I actually have a teacher that I go to and I say, man, I'm this far, but I know there's this more to go and I'm not getting there. I'm just staying on my little plateau because I'm scared to go know what's next, right? (laughs) Can you help? She always does, right? She goes, well, have you thought about this? And I say, bye, gotta go. (laughs) Right? Because I know that that's the next place to go, right? Even that, right? You are the expert on you. If I say something to someone in a session and it doesn't ring true for them, I go, okay, I'm not, I'm barking up the wrong tree. You know, the only filters I have on life are mine. I try not to use my filters on you, but that's why, you know, a lot of people ask me if they can um, learn to do this work for other people. Oh, I'm learning about my chakras. Can I work on other people? Can I be a healer? Yeah, you can, but no, not today. Right? <laughs> not to not to be um not to be unkind about it, but what you will do if you don't understand what's going on in your energy system, your own energy system is you'll just project it onto other people and you'll read it in them. Make sense? Which is why when you know, for example, like I know that my third chakra is always challenged, right? That's my solar plexus. And the reason I know that is because that's where I tucked my emotional response as a child to my parents and grandparents' alcoholism, right? That's where my ACOA kid lives. My adult child of an alcoholic lives in my third chakra, right? So when I look at somebody else's third chakra, mm -mm -mm, I got to be really careful to keep mine over here and yours over there. So I'm actually looking at yours, not mine, right? Because that's a vulnerable place in my energy system, right? When I'm whacked out, when I'm exhausted, when I'm really, really tired or really, really excited, my, my solar plexus will ache because that's where there's vulnerability, right? I mean, I was surrounded by alcoholics as a kid. Uh, okay, I had to put it somewhere. At least I know now, right? Anybody else? Uh, I've got a question um, uh, about um, this, having this fear, anticipating the anxiety. I think my that's my eighth uh, chakra. Is that correct? Your eighth chakra? The the, the base, you know, the base. Uh, what is the your base chakra? Root, root chakra, yeah, first. That's chakra. it. So yeah, that's it. The root chakra is. Is anxiety and fear yes. a lot correct. of the, a lot of the time? It depends on where it came from. Is it personal fear? Are you not safe? Did you grow up in an environment in any way that wasn't safe? Right. Did you, or do you live in a place that isn't safe? Like, is it home? Is it, is it the country you live in? Is it the world you live in? Do you not feel safe about that? And that's true for all of us. We all share a certain amount of existential anxiety because Mm. the world, because it's getting so much 
in a way fuller and smaller and in more trouble, we're, we're all a little bit anxious about the planet. We're worried and legitimately, right? That's completely normal. What do you do about the fear? Well, you do what you can about your environment. You make sure that you drink a lot of water. You make sure that you help soothe other people's anxiety and it will soothe yours, right? You give what you want. Make sense? It does. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Anybody else? Well, then I want to remind you that you can go to chakras.susancorso.com and get yourself the less mores on a pretty piece of picture that you can download immediately and start to work if you want. Um, the workbooks are available on Amazon. They're called Energy Integrity. It is always my pleasure to work with One Spirit. It is great fun. And I, David, I thank you very much for your diligence. And I thank everybody for attending. If I can be of service to any one of you, there are contact forms on my websites, susancorso.com or iampersand.org. That's I-A-M-P-E-R-S-A-N-D.org. And I do take private clients sometimes. Mostly what I'm thinking about doing lately is some group teaching. So if you are interested, stay on the Susan, on the chakras.susancorso.com page and another page will come up where you can put your email address in and I will stay in touch. A blessing upon all of you. Be chakra detectives. Thank you very much. Take good care of yourselves.